Hi there, I'm Nafi Salatic and this is a special episode of Across the Balkans dedicated to the Srebrenica genocide. It's been 26 years since Bosnian Serb forces attacked a UN-designated safe area and systematically massacred more than 8,000 Muslim men and boys. Those troops were led by Ratko Mladic, who recently had his life sentence upheld for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. This year, the remains of 19 more victims who have been identified will be buried, the youngest of whom was just 16. His name was Azmir Osmanovic. As the search continues for around 1,000 people who have never been found, the voices of those who deny that a genocide took place grow louder. We'll speak to the director of the Srebrenica Genocide Memorial Center in a moment. But first, Axel Zajmovic looks back at what led to the horrifying events of July 1995. Srebrenica. The name has become synonymous with anti-Muslim hatred and mass murder. It was here, 26 years ago, that an unspeakable horror took place. A tragedy that seemed unimaginable just years earlier. Yugoslavia was a country that represented unity between different ethnic groups. But the Federation of Diverse Republics started to crumble under the weight of ethnic tensions and economic failure. In 1991, Slovenia and Croatia declared independence. Armed conflict broke out and eventually spilled over to Bosnia and Herzegovina. The Bosnian leadership called for a referendum on independence, but Bosnian Serb leaders strongly objected. This is the pathway along which you wish to see Bosnia and Herzegovina go, the same lethal highway to hell that Slovenia and Croatia went down. Do not think that you will lead Bosnia and Herzegovina to hell and drive Muslims to annihilation. Muslims cannot defend themselves if a war breaks out. In March 1992, the Bosnian people were overwhelmingly in favor of independence. Tensions simmered across the country. A month later, a Serbia-based paramilitary group attacked the border city of Bijeljina, killing dozens of civilians. It marked the beginning of a brutal war and the campaign of ethnic cleansing against Bosnian Muslims. Over four years, the country saw unspeakable atrocities. The capital, Sarajevo, endured the longest siege in modern history. The city of Priedor was the site of some of the worst war crimes of the conflict. The Bosnian Serb army, supported by Yugoslav forces, began a campaign of ethnic cleansing. Deportation, torture, and killings paved the way for the genocide that took place in Srebrenica in July 1995. In November of the same year, a peace deal was finally struck. It stopped the killings, but further divided the country along ethnic lines. Bosnia is now divided into two entities, the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the Republika Srpska and self-governed District Brčko. Overall, it is estimated that 100,000 people died in the war. More than 50,000 women were raped, including girls at the age of seven. Since the war, the country's population has shrunk by almost a quarter. A UN tribunal was tasked to prosecute war criminals. More than 160 people stood trial, including some high-ranking officials from Bosnia, Serbia and Croatia. In June, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia upheld Ratko Mladic's life sentence for genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity for his role in directing the slaughter in Srebrenica. But despite international rulings, some politicians in Bosnia and Serbia still denied the genocide took place. In fact, genocide denial is growing through a mix of political pressure and historical revisionism, which disputes the intent and scale of the massacres. It adds insult to the fatal injuries of the victims here. Victims who are still being identified and buried three decades on. Axel Zajmovic, 
TRT World. My guest today is Emir Suljagic. He is the director of the Srebrenica Genocide Memorial Center and he joins us now from Srebrenica. Emir, I appreciate your time for us uh, for Across the Balkans. Uh, now, a, a month ago, uh, the former Bosnian Serb commander Ratko Mladic has lost his appeal and was sentenced for life in prison for genocide. But regardless of the court's decisions and international condemnations, uh, we are seeing a rise in genocide denial and ethno-nationalism in Bosnia and across the region. What needs to be done to reduce this so that the countries can finally move forward? Well, first of all, um, thank you for having me on your program. Um, I guess there isn't a simple and short answer to, letter, to your question, um, but I assume that one of the ways to deal with that would be to ensure that political actors and, and governments that are deeply involved in the denial of Bosnian genocide um, are faced, are made to face the consequences because of that. Um, the Severance Memorial Center presented um, its um, genocide denial report for uh, for 2020, 2021, um, and uh, one of the findings was that, for instance, the government, the, uh, when it comes to genocide denial, um, uh, it is institutional, both institutional and institutionalized in Serbia. Two thirds of all uh, statements and all uh, all of media uh, genocide denial come from Serbia, and they come from the media that are actually. Uh, uh, very uh, uh, close to the government or owned by the government. Um, so yeah, we can talk about about institutional denial uh, in both Serbia and part of the Bosnia that's known as Republika Srpska. And once again, I mean, there's the only way to do that is to make the political leaders realize that there is a price to um, to such policy. Uh, there's a price to such practice. Um, not legitimate, legitimize their uh, genocide denial by meeting them and, and engaging with them on other um, uh, issues is one of the ways to uh, to deal with it. One of the ways to make them stop genocide denial is is a logical extension of any genocidal operation, and um, in that regard, uh, uh, political leaders like Alexander Vucic and and Milorad Dodik are are continuing in the in the footsteps of, of Radko Mladic and Radovan Karadzic and Slobodan Milosevic. Right, and as someone who survived the genocide and witnessed uh, many things that were happening during the war, how does it feel uh, for you and others who lost their loved ones uh, to live surrounded by those who actually deny that genocide even took place? I do want to hear your personal perspective of this because I know you do live in the area too. Uh, well, to be honest, I, um, I, I've long stopped worrying about that on a, on, 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 on a personal level. Um, I've long stopped uh, caring about what it is that, 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 that they say personally. I'm concerned, what I'm concerned with is uh, why, are, why they're doing it, what they're trying to achieve. Um, and and the narrative that they're building about it that that's my concern uh, personally you know uh, these I, I you know these people cannot touch me all right they cannot reach touch any one of us um they've already done what you know what they could to us if they could do it again they would do it again um and because we're dealing with a group of people that's uh, only not doing things that is incapable of doing um the moment that they're capable of, of doing it again, they will do it again. Now, what's important here is to understand that Serbia uh, and their proxy in Bosnia are, are trying to uh, revise history. Um, and they're trying to do that by imposing themselves upon the survivors and upon the rest of the world with their distorted narrative. Uh, and and the, 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 the very, a very false notion of trying to start a dialogue over the Srebrenica. There is no dialogue over the Srebrenica. Uh, <clears throat> what, we what we're dealing with uh, are two different narratives. One of the narratives is based on 
forensic evidence and hours upon hours of invest investigations and uh, 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 right. hundreds of hours of testimony. And on the other side, you have the words of few people who are paid by the governments of Alexander Vucic or Milorad Dodik to, uh, to say such stuff. Right, right. Uh, yeah, so that, 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 that's, that's what's going on, really. Uh, let me jump in here because, you know, this narrative uh, is now spreading throughout the borders of Bosnia. Uh, over the past two decades, far-right political groups in the region and even around the globe have adopted a path of genocide denial to promote their agenda. Uh, even the Christchurch attacker used rather Mladic's slogans in his manifesto. What is the link here and why are these extremists so attracted to this ideology? Uh, there is a relatively simple explanation. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure I can, but I'm not really sure I can actually fully explain uh, or account for that um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a video interview. Uh, uh, the, at, at the center of it all, at the center of um, at the center of, of it all is the, this, the notion of the Turk. The notion, a very racialized notion of Islam, of Bosnian Muslims, uh, that that you know Bosnian genocide and Bosnian genocide denial was a platform for right-wing uh, extremists uh, all over Europe. Um, but because the Bosnian Serb media, because the Bosnian well Serbian media and Serbian academia and Serbian political class portrayed the war in Bosnia. Uh, or actually this genocide masquerading as war um, as the struggle against a foreign and oppressive civilization, um, as the struggle of, uh, against Islam, as the struggle against this, once again, very racialized um, notion of the Turk. You know, the, 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 when Ratko Mladic entered Srebrenica on July 11, uh, 1990, 1985, one of the first things that he said was that the time has come to take revenge upon the Turks. Now, um, that is part of the Bosnian Serb and Serbian, I'm sorry, narrative from the 90s that uh, Breivik and the Christchurch attacker and many other far right um, uh, uh, extremists and activists have picked up on uh, in their attempt to create a um, to make you know and integrate it into their into their own into their own platforms um, and and adjusted it in a way to to um, to 21st century. Uh, right, and uh, having in mind all this um, uh, genocide denial, the rise of ethno-nationalism, and all the things that you've said, what kind of message does the Srebrenica Memorial Center? Uh, want to send on the 26th anniversary uh, of the genocide, what would be your main message uh, this year? Almost well, about 1,500 individuals we're still looking for. Um, there are 1,500 families out there, or close to 1,500 families who are still looking for their loved ones, who still haven't buried them, um, who uh, are still... Um, going to bed every night not knowing where their loved ones are and if there's one question that we want to raise 26 years after the fact then it is the question of the missing persons um it's not over um it's it's and it's high time to intensify the effort to find all the missing all the missing persons, all the missing, we try and, you know, make, to the extent possible, all of these individuals, all of these families whole again. Okay, Emir Suljagic, uh, the director of the Srebrenica Genocide Memorial Center. Emir, I really appreciate your time for us. I know you're very busy, and uh, let's hope uh, a lot of these questions, we will have answers one day, especially of where are the, the remains of those we are still looking for. Thank you so much, Emir, once again. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot. As genocide denial grows, there are some political efforts being made to put a stop to it. Montenegro has now passed a law that bans anyone from publicly denying the Srebrenica genocide. The bill was controversial and was opposed by some in the government. Kosovo has also followed in Montenegro's footsteps, adopting its own resolution this month. Serbian President Aleksandar Vucic has criticized both countries, saying the laws are a blow to the Serbs. Anja Sekulic has this report for us from Montenegro's capital, Podgorica.
The heat in Montenegro's beautiful capital Podgorica shifted from the streets into the country's parliament building. The Srebrenica genocide resolution is a hot topic here, especially for politicians representing the Serb population of the country. Zločine su radili naši ljudi. Oni nisu potezali puške, nisu imali kame u rukama, nisu bacali bombe, nisu palili sela. Ako su kao instrument bili nemoćni da to spriječe, vjerovatno imaju lanac odgovornosti, ali oni zločine nisu radili. Debate similar to this one led to the removal of pro-serve Minister of Justice, Human and Minority Rights, Vladimir Leposavić. He said Srebrenica was a terrible crime, but not genocide. The governing coalition wants to prevent such outbursts in future by proposing a resolution condemning the genocide. The of this resolution about genocide in Srebrenica was the purpose of the peace of the people in Gori and all the people around the country. So, again, I would like to thank all of them who helped us to get a quality text of the resolution of genocide in Srebrenica and I believe that we have sent a clear signal from this presidential house that Crna Gora is the center of democracy in the region. The resolution passed with 55 votes in favor and 19 against in the 81-member assembly. Hoping to bring an end to hate speech of genocide in Ireland Montenegro, the document enables authorities to investigate and prosecute all those who denied Srebrenica genocide or undermine the victims of Yugoslav wars. Wars which sowed the worst atrocities on European soil since World War II and caused the deaths of more than 100,000 people. Anja Sekulic, PRT World, Podgorica. To get more on this, political analyst Ljubomir Filipović joins us now. He used to be the deputy and acting mayor of the Montenegrin town of Budva. Ljubomir, thanks so much for being with us here on the show. Uh, firstly, why was the Srebrenica genocide resolution so divisive uh, in Montenegro? And were the people of Montenegro as divided as the politician? Yes, they are. Uh, so uh, up until uh, the August last year, where we had a change, political change, changes in the country happened after three decades of the rule of one party. Uh, there was a fear in one part of the population present uh, that uh, it might change also uh, the system, value system that was present in the country that we were building after the war uh, in the Balkans in the 90s. Uh, Montenegrin society, its orthodox majority, orthodox Christian majority is divided. One part of uh, the Orthodox majority is thinking that we should uh, build a society that's equal for everyone, that uh, doesn't have a domination of certain ethnic or religious community. And then the other uh, part of the Orthodox majority, which now is dominant in the new ruling coalition, thinks the other way, thinks that uh, Montenegro should be dominated by uh, Serbian interests, that Montenegro should be a tool of the Belgrade politics, and uh, when, you, when you consider the fact that uh, this is, uh, that's the, the denial of Srebrenica genocide is a, a uh, uh, official uh, Belgrade policy, then, then you can much easier, much more, uh, much easier understand the situation uh, in right. Montenegro right now. Right, then... Uh... The coalition is it's quite interesting that's currently ruling the country. It's made of pro-Western and pro-Serb parties. So how difficult uh, will it be for them to keep working together following this decision? Yeah, after this decision, the first uh, serious gap and crisis in the ruling coalition took place. Uh, the coalition passed the Montenegrin parliament. Also, the uh, genocide denier minister of justice, uh, Vladimir Lefelsavich, was sacked due to his uh, public denial of the, gen of the genocide, in genocide in Srebrenica. So under the pressure from our foreign partners, from our Western partners, 
uh, he was uh, pushed into into uh, passing those two decisions, uh, which caused uh, an earthquake in the ruling coalition. So we are now having a, a very hot summer, political summer in Montenegro, that will continue, I think, until September when we have the next parliament session. Uh, currently, there are maybe a dozen MPs supporting the prime minister in the parliament. There are some pretty uh, clear and, and loud voices that are calling for his withdrawal, for his resignation. So we will have a we will have a lot of problems because of the uh, of the really uh, right now. I've been the, the, uh, right. Uh -huh. and, Sorry. Uh, yes, and I've been observing this growing polarization of Montenegrin society over the past year, even before uh, the resolution was passed in the parliament. Why are we seeing this trend in Montenegro, and how do you think we should we could stop the rise of ethno nationalism in in the country? The problem is a, a century-old division in Montenegro. Uh, it's, it's an identity problem. Uh, Montenegrins are not um, ethnic majority. Uh, the religious majority, Orthodox Christian majority in Montenegro, is not divided uh, on, on ethnic lines. Uh, the division is more, more ideological because there is no single family in Montenegro that, there, that, that is divided, that is not divided. Uh, some of the there 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 is a rule more than an exception that uh, siblings from the same family coming from same parents are identifying themselves differently. Uh, this is a very complicated question, and it will not uh, be solved if we continue to have pressure from Serbia, meddling from Serbia and Russia, and the Serbian Orthodox Church. Uh, right. And uh, how, can uh, the resolutions be actually effective uh, in uniting uh, the region one day? We've seen Kosovo's parliament also uh, passing the resolution uh, following uh, the, uh, the one that Montenegro passed, uh, also forbidding denial of the genocide. And this is in line with the European values. And this is the path that Montenegro and Kosovo both w want to follow. Now, once we uh, have agreement in the region, that crimes uh, such as the one that happened in Srebrenica should never repeat, or, or when we come to an uh, agreement and, 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 uh, in, in the region among all the parties, including Serbia, and firstly Serbia, then we can build a mutual future together. Uh, it's not only about this genocide in Srebrenica, those are the values that you, that you are talking about. Uh, if you if you cherish European values, then you need to confront your uh, your dark past, the recent past, and that's the best way to build build a common future. Uh, Kosovo uh, has another problem that many of the crimes that took place in Kosovo too, perpetrated by Serbian and Montenegrin governments at the time in the 90s, are also being denied by the Serbian government and part of the Montenegrin society and part of the Mon Montenegrin political elites. So uh, if we don't have a consensus within the Montenegrin society and broader uh, within the region, then we're facing a, a long-standing and, and long-term problems in the region. And what do you make of uh, the remarks by the Serbian president, Aleksandar Vucic, following uh, Montenegrin and uh, Kosovo's resolution on Srebrenica, saying that this will only divide the region more and these are, these are the resolutions that, that go against the Serbs? in the region, no matter where they live. I think that Mr. Vucic should leave Serbs in the region, uh, build their own futures within the societies they are part of. Uh, Serbian meddling, meddling of the official Belgrade, only brought misery to the Serbs in the region, in, uh, whether they were in Bosnia, Croatia, Kosovo or Montenegro. So if, if they build their autonom autonomous policies and if, they, if the Serbs in the region uh, understand that uh, the, the, the future, their future is connected to the countries they live in. Uh, that is, that is the, the, the only solution for, for them to, to have a, a safe and a stable future as a community. Uh, with Serbian meddling, uh, unfortunately, Serbian uh, regime is trying to, uh, to bring focus on, on, on some of the topics that are much easier for them to deal with other from the 
uh, freedom of media, the autocratic nature of the Serbian regime and, and other things that are really important for the Serbs within Serbia and for the Serbian society at first place, in first place. Okay, Ljubomir, we'll, we have to leave it there for time. Thank you so much for giving us this insight into the topic. Ljubomir Filipovic, there, an analyst and consultant, formerly served as the deputy and acting mayor of Budva, that's a city in Montenegro. Thanks again, Ljubomir. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching this episode of Across the Balkans, the show dedicated to the people, places and stories of southeastern Europe. Hope to see you next time.